So I'm in Amsterdam right now, as evidenced the Amsterdam Hotel behind me and the skinny bridge there. Now it's time to get to The Hague. There we are. So uh, are you guys ready to uh, join me for some little uh, art tour? Here we go. <laughs> Hello Sea Wolves and welcome to the show. So this time uh, from my gallery uh, in The Hague. And if you're wondering why I'm wearing my coat, because it's actually about uh, three degrees or something in here, because as you can see, it's a huge space. And uh, because we're uh, we're closed officially because of lockdown, so we're not allowed actually uh, to open at all. Uh, so we only do kind of tours for people who, you know, ask about it and then on, a, on an appointment, we can, you know, show them around. But it's a huge space, so uh, we're not going to heat it if it's not uh, necessary. So that's why, uh, the coat but uh, after the sailing news I'll give you a bit of a, a tour so you can actually see you know kind of the artist and the art uh, that I uh, represent for those of you many of you who have you know t told me that you wanted to uh, see some of that so uh, after the news uh, we're going to show you a lot of uh, hopefully very beautiful uh, art. Then straight into the sailing news. So uh, great stuff happening in the Jules Verne. Uh, actually uh, still on the website that within 24 to 48 hours maybe um, a launching chance, launching window. So with a little luck in the next 48 hours or so, we will actually see uh, Gitana make a new uh, record attempt, which would be super cool, of course. So if anything uh, changes there or they actually set a concrete launch window, I will, of course, let you know right away. Then let's move on to uh, the Van de Globe. And um, yeah, the next uh, uh, two gents, so uh, Thomas Riant and of course, uh, Mr. Sagin, both uh, made it uh, past uh, Cape Horn. So good news uh, there. Uh, in the in, more in the in the hunter pack we have Isabel Joschke that uh, has now developed some uh, keel problems so for the last 24 hours or so it seems uh, that she's not able to cant her keel a problem with the hydraulics I don't know if it's a similar problem to uh, what Ellen Rora is experiencing but it's definitely uh, serious if she's you know unable to move her keel so we'll have to see how that goes as she is now entering kind of the area of uh, Cape Horn so I'll keep an eye on it and if there's any news uh, there I'll uh, let you know but it's definitely going to be a very tricky situation uh, for her passing the Cape. Fortunately, like I discussed yesterday, they have kind of okay weather, 20 to 25 knots for the most part and only all the way in the end when they really get to the Cape will they also be hit by 30 to 35 knots, so a relatively short period. But uh, yeah, we'll have to see how Isabel uh, gets through it. But uh, more on that if I uh, know anything. So um, let's hop straight into uh, uh, the weather map and uh, take a look at the situation uh, right now. Oh yeah, and last thing, so uh, uh, Pip doing really well, and uh, later in the week, I'm probably going to do an interview with her technical uh, director, and we're going to talk in depth about kind of the problems that are going on, the solutions that they're working on. So we're gonna get a real insight, uh, you know, with a little hindsight, because we're gonna talk about what's going to happen in the next two, three days, let's say, when I actually have the interview. But we'll have a good technical, uh, you know, kind of insight and conversation about, you know, how do you actually, as a team, solve this type of problem. So that's something I think also really to uh, look forward to. Okay, now let's get into the weather and the predictions. Okay, so uh, as you can see, we have here uh, the next two uh, gents, so uh, Damien uh, Sagin and Thomas Riant, who both past the Cape, relatively close to the Cape, as you can see. So they took also a route that is a bit more closer uh, uh, to shore, just like uh, um, Charlie Dalin did, but unlike, uh, you know, what, uh, what Yannick Best have and the route that he took. And it seems, you know, distance-wise that Yannick kind of, uh, you know, headed right as far as it looks uh, right now, because we see that uh, Charlie, who initially had opted to take a similar route, to uh, uh, what these two, uh, what, uh, what linked out and, uh, and Damien uh, were going to try uh, to do it, Group Apicil, to go, you know, pass on the inside with the Falklands Islands, but, uh, you know, decided that weather-wise it was better actually to move on the outside. So we see that he's been, uh, you know, moving himself more to the route and giving uh, in that process um, Yannick Besthaven again a considerable extra lead. So Yannick actually now at a uh, almost 200 meter, a 200 nautical mile lead over uh, uh, Charlie Dalin, and then another 300 or so mile to Thomas Ruyant, and of course to the rest of the fleet, he is really 
about seven, eight hundred miles uh, ahead now, which, which we kind of also predicted, uh, you know, would happen several days. And so that's very interesting and a very, very good position um, that Yannick is in right now. And as you can see, weather-wise, looks really quite uh, uh, nice for him. Good, uh, good weather right now. We have, of course, kind of the you know the the high pressure uh, here but moving in a relatively favorable uh, direction right now and it seems that um, yeah the weather is going to be uh, opening up and he might have some a stronger wind some smaller uh, some areas with a little bit less wind but overall it looks like a very good and ignore this kind of predictive lines because they're, they're all over the place right now and they're not making really any sense so if we look a bit uh, behind there of course we see that uh, the pack of hunters now very close to uh, to the Cape and we see the really strong weather following right on their heels so right now they're still okay like I said 25 knots or so you know nice speed to round the Cape in a safe manner but this weather is getting closer very quickly and in about five to six hours from now that's going to reach them and at midnight uh, today so this is around one o'clock on uh, Tuesday so midnight tonight they're all going to be really in it uh, you know with uh, with wind uh, gusts easily up to uh, 40 knots uh, probably, so uh, pretty intense. At the same time, we see uh, that here uh, Armel Tripon and of course uh, 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 Clarice Kramer really getting a lot closer again uh, to the hunters as they're passing the Cape, as they're constantly, you know, they're in the same weather uh, system now, really quite close uh, uh, to each other. And I think that, well, if this continues uh, like this, once they have reached the position that Yannick and Charlie are in right now, I think they're gonna be another 100 or maybe 200 miles closer uh, together as they have to slow down quite a bit when they get to the strongest of the weather uh, while they are going to be able to pass through it with the strongest kind of ahead of them. So they're gonna be able to keep, I think, better uh, uh, speeds. And so uh, with a little luck, they'll be able to uh, uh, actually keep gaining while the rest of the hunters are going to have to slow down a little bit and they might get a little bit more of an advantage uh, there so that's kind of nice uh, to see then if we move back we see that uh, Pip really held to her own so uh, we know that Alan is in trouble and you know not doing great speed right now because he's dealing with his keel and hydraulic problems but at the same time um, of course, uh, Arnold Bozeris, you know, has a, has a good boat, is working, but uh, has been just a little bit uh, slower. And Pip doing really well, more or less the same speed as Arnold right now, um, but keeping her lead. And so she's actually, our little Pip, in a steady uh, 15th uh, position. So that is really, really super nice. And uh, right behind there now, close to their heels, we see uh, Jeremy Bijou really uh, killing it. Good speeds right now, of course, in a strong storm. So you had to slow down a little bit, but still 12.4, 13.6 average over the last 12 hours, which is, uh, you know, more or less the same speed as what, uh, what Pip is doing. So uh, they're, they're nicely making it making it together. And if we're looking at the rest of the prediction, we see that they're gonna have pretty nice wind, not too much, not, not enough, just exactly 25 knots for the most part until Wednesday when, as you can see, they get into stronger uh, weather. But that means for the next 24 hours, gonna be a good race between Shirelle and the rest here. And you know we might see uh, Jeremy get a lot closer to Pip and her group again there once he gets out of this really strong uh, system. Then behind there, Dida Costa, uh, you know, kind of holding back a little bit. This storm will probably have passed him. So he's doing good speeds right now, 13.1 knots. And I think he'll keep going uh, more or less just like that. Same for uh, Mr. Uh, Sharishi, also doing really nice nice good speeds right now no big problems there and uh, then if we move all the way to the back uh, because uh, the situation with uh, Sebastian is really uh, getting quite problematic as you see uh, you know his track is all over the place and what I heard is that um, so he doesn't have any form of auto steering now he's completely uh, manually steering uh, the boat so it's quite a serious situation and as I said before we'll have to wait and see how his situation develops. If he's able to create any kind of auto steering uh, uh, system that will help him to the race. Otherwise, I think that uh, we're very likely going to see, unfortunately, uh, Sebastian, uh, uh, you know, forfeit or, uh, you know, abandon the race at, uh, at some point. So uh, we'll have to see what happens. I hope that he somehow pulls through, but it's hard to say uh, right now what will uh, happen. And so, um, yeah, that's more or less the status of, uh, of the entire race um, right now. So, um, yeah, 
keeping it a little bit short because uh, as you can see very busy and I have a meeting after this actually with an artist that I'm going to uh, you know uh, have talked to you also and show some of his work so uh, that was it for the sailing news today uh, you know if you only want the sailing uh, news please uh, make sure to uh, like the video right now give a thumbs up and uh, you know make sure to subscribe and hit that like button and uh, yeah this is the end of the sailing news for today now let's show you guys some art so here we are welcome to my uh, place of business as you can see uh, so it's uh, well kind of interesting if I can turn this thing around here so as you can see I'm still wearing my jacket because it's super uh, cold actually uh, in here because uh, right now uh, we are we're closed because of the corona rules so all the stores in Holland are actually uh, mandatorily closed right now and uh, that of course uh, means that we also have to be closed so we're not going to heat uh, this enormous space if we're not going to use it because it's about 1500 uh, square meters on the on the on this floor and then we have another 1500 or so square meters um, on the second floor which i'll show you in a minute but let's uh, walk in so here you can see we have a little uh, corona uh, station where people can wash their hands and you know write their name and everything is all obligated and then we have this beautiful piece by Ringo 1984 a local uh, uh, The Hague uh, artist who's uh, very uh, big in the graffiti uh, street art scene here and of course we have one of the presidents uh, here on a, on a dollar bill but uh, corona style we, we asked him to make that kind of uh, especially for this particular exposition when we're still open Ringo 1984 now and uh, we have also some very nice Ringo pieces behind here so uh, this is kind of fun it's like uh, so this is our actually Gilder so it's the the money that we used to have before we got the Euro the good old Gilder and uh, this three piece is uh, hearing seeing and silence to hear to see and to be silent so we see the blue one obviously being silence then we have kind of fun the the green one with of course the Tug Life glasses and then on top we have uh, this uh, classic man with some headphones and then in here we have uh, this is used to be the 250 Gilder bill which used to have a lighthouse on the back but he actually of course as a graffiti artist changed that very coolly to a uh, spray can uh, let's walk through here I'll actually show you the uh, bar area first so yeah, I'm a very social guy and it's really always nice to you know have a lot of artists and creative people you know hang out here uh, you know usually when we're open so we have a beautiful bar here with a pool table because you have to have some fun games uh, to play of course and you can see some you know smaller artworks and stuff here I'll tell you a little bit about that and of course we have the bar here where uh, as I had to switch cameras from the GoPro I just put all my stuff here and you can see the coffee press <laughs> yeah so um, I'll give you guys a little round uh, tour so we're starting from the bar area here so first you can see that we have some uh, you know smaller uh, pieces here in uh, in ceramics uh, for the most uh, part super nice uh, stuff and especially these these are by Mo Cornelissen and uh, you know each statue kind of represents a different emotion so things like uh, feeling boxed in or losing your footing or uh, feeling like somebody stole your heart or this one is missing a face so I guess it's uh, you know losing face uh, and also some beautiful uh, like bigger sculpture for on a table or on a wall very beautiful stuff and Mo is kind of famous for also making very big artworks for uh, cruise ships and stuff so this is kind of smaller items that she makes but she also makes very very big uh, works um, that are like kind of the centerpieces of you know big staircases and stuff on cruise ships this is kind of fun like I haven't even seen these yet because they've just been delivered last week some very big cool chairs I don't know what to tell you about them because uh, my partner brought those in so I actually don't know uh, this is a really cool artist from The Hague also let me switch the out of focus here Mr. Erwin Verkade and uh, behind here there's also a beautiful work by him I kind of like to show you very cool uh, piece he's a very 
very nicely, very well defined style, very rustic, very cool. And uh, he takes a lot of time to make each work. They're super finely uh, worked. Like the details are just, the attention to detail, I should say, is really, uh, you know, level, level crazy with Erwin. But uh, yeah, I really love it. He has such a unique style. And no matter where you go in the world, if you see a painting by him, you will, you know, instantly know that that is uh, Verkade, which is, uh, you know, always the touch of the master. Then uh, over here, there's also a really fun uh, piece. This is by uh, Stefan Grols. He's uh, definitely one of our most popular artists. You probably, if you're a bit familiar with art, you've maybe seen works like this on, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in the fairs in Miami or New York or Tokyo. He's very, very uh, famous, especially for his wall pieces. And the cool thing about this, it kind of looks like glass. Of course, it's like a permanent uh, bouquet of flowers. It's called a flower bomb. But this is actually made and made of bioplastic. So it's actually quite flexible. And uh, yeah, it's handmade, and then they use pigments to completely, uh, you know, paint it with natural paint, and it's made from uh, recycled bioplastic. So it's kind of also an environmentally friendly artwork to, uh, you know, use recycled plastic. I'll show you some of the wall pieces that we have here also, which are very cool. So uh, yeah, as you can see. They're quite large, they're about a meter 20 by a meter 20 centimeters. And uh, yeah, let me zoom in here a little bit. Like it's highly detailed work, all handcrafted. Takes about a month to make one of these. And these are three of his newest, most recent creations. So this is a bit of darker color, as you can see. A little close up. And uh, it's made out of the same material, so it looks, you know, sometimes almost like it's glass. A lot of people are also always very scared to uh, touch it, but you actually can uh, touch it. It's very nice, sturdy material. And let's move on to, uh, this is kind of cool for the sea wolves actually. So this is uh, William Rosewood. And uh, he made this art piece, which is actually nine pieces, but there are four of them here. The other ones are in Miami right now. And um, they got stuck after the art fair there uh, because of all the Corona uh, things that are going on in the world. But um, he uh, took the, the animals that are on the top of the endangered species list. So uh, this here is a uh, endangered sea turtle. And uh, this is a endangered river dolphin, the skull. And this is a snow leopard. And this is a hammerhead shark. So they're all uh, from the endangered species uh, list. And he uh, went to zoos and collectors to kind of find uh, these skulls and then had them plated in 24 karat uh, gold. And so there's nine in total. He also has a big uh, black rhino uh, skull and a tiger. I think they're a little bit larger. So the larger ones went to Miami for the fair. But they're really, really beautiful. Uh, pieces and uh, yeah very cool uh, story William Rosewood and this beautiful paintings are also by William so he's a very versatile guy works with a lot of materials but very environmentally uh, conscious and uh, this particular piece is called uh, the beauty of nature we destroy and uh, yeah I think as sea wolves uh, we can all kind of relate to the things that we've seen, you know, with plastic in the water. And well, you know, I'm not gonna waste too much time on that here, but you all know what it's about these days. Uh, then here's uh, Katelijn Wouters, painter uh, from Amsterdam, from my uh, city, very nice lady. And uh, yeah, she has this very beautiful, very flowing, very emotional style of painting and drawing. It's often very mixed materials. And uh, she paints very fast, so she often makes kind of a lot of paintings very fast and then selects them, makes them into collages. You know, often different paints uh, on uh, paper and you know, kind of combinations. Like I said, very cool, very emotional uh, work. Very beautiful. Often uh, paints models. So also this work is also based on a model. It's called The Night. And these are very large. They're about 180 
uh, and this one is I think two meters by 170 or 180 so pretty large works but very beautiful another really cool painter this actually also came in about two weeks ago is uh, Gert Banuscher and uh, this is a really uh, special because uh, you may think that this is actually a picture but this is actually a painter and uh, Gert is one of the most ultra real he's one of the most famous ultra realistic painters in the world really and uh, as you can see if I zoom into this it's just it's well n almost indistinguishable from a picture it's like so detailed and his touch is so uh, precise but uh, yeah they're absolutely stunning works really beautiful this just came from another uh, location uh, of ours and then here we have uh, Danu, a photographer, good friend of mine also and he travels all over the world and he's very interested in the beauty of decay so he kind of travels the world he has a whole team that's kind of always on the lookout for areas of the world where maybe before there was a lot of uh, wealth but now there's been an earthquake or an economic depression or something like that and uh, he he finds in these areas uh, you know buildings sometimes factories sometimes very beautiful houses that have been uh, you know abandoned for a long uh, time so this is a mansion in Italy for example um, and then uh, often uh, you know with risk to his own life he enters these places uh, sometimes uh, even breaks into them in order to kind of photograph what uh, what time has done to these uh, beautiful locations this is an Italian uh, spa really really beautiful uh, works you know full of secrets you can look at a picture like this and just discover lots and lots of cool details uh, in the work and uh, yeah we're one of the very few places in the world that exclusively um, you know sell uh, sell his uh, pictures because they're all limited editions obviously so you can see that we have quite a few of his works in different uh, sizes this is also one of my favorites of him it's a very beautiful uh, you know one of those classic gardens greenhouses completely overgrown beautiful beautiful work and then we have here some works by Henk Bothoff photographer but he's actually about to uh, come here because that's the reason I'm here I have a meeting with Henk today uh, so I thought it would be cool that actually he himself can tell you a few things about his beautiful this is from a series in Ethiopia that he took a little while uh, ago but he, he's going to tell you guys a little bit about them himself but I'm joined here by uh, Hank Bothoff, photographer extraordinaire. So, uh, shall we walk over to your work? Ah, it's good, uh, Florian. Tell us a little bit yeah. us something about it. Uh, tell us a little bit, uh, Hank. Uh, who are you, first of all? Well, and tell us something about of course. these amazing uh, pictures that you. Well, my name is Hank Bothoff, and I traveled uh, for 40 years to Africa, Middle East, South America, and. Uh, well, uh, my, uh, my interest is uh, tribal people, and so in the years I uh, started to be a professional photographer uh, to make the most beautiful portraits of this really very, very special people. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, and uh -huh. uh, where I'm looking for, this is for example, is a photo of the uh, fight ceremony, the Donga of the Suri people in uh, Ethiopia. Uh -huh. I've been there several times, and um, this is one of the Suri uh, boys and you are also kind of famous for the fact because these are pretty dangerous areas actually that you go in uh, to make these uh, pictures yeah that's true and yeah. you're kind of famous for you know having really uh, good friendships with this type of uh, tribal people and staying there a little bit longer like how do you how do you do it how do you convince this type of you know, uh, folks to let you photograph such intimate uh, ceremonies. And stuff. Yeah, well, that's, it's sometimes very difficult because uh, sometimes the ceremonies are only for the insiders and not for the outsiders, uh -huh. and especially not for what, what the Africans call the Muzungus, the white men. Uh -huh. So it's a kind of uh, making contact. So uh, the photographing is always on the end yeah. of the meeting. And in the beginning, you have to talk with each other 
uh, find that the, also um, what people want uh -huh. um, and also that you ask them questions mm -hmm. what are their rituals why they do that and uh, etc cetera, etc cetera, so that they see that your interest for the for their uh, people for their tribe yeah. that that is real and not only to taking a few pictures yeah, yeah. what a lot of people do and uh, you you often uh, photograph the ritual and also the people in the ritual like more in a close-up situation so we actually see here behind you the the donga like the fight in in action but yeah. a little bit here to the side mm -hmm. actually see also one of these donga fighters uh you know with the with the beautiful uh, kind of ceremonial but I guess it's also for protection. This is for, pro yeah, for yeah, protection, right. that's what I made. And they have also protection on their hands. Uh -huh. Because the stick fightings, what you see in the other picture, can be very heavy. Yeah. And uh, sometimes they have really serious injuries. And uh, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes somebody get killed also. Wow. And uh, so it's really serious. And you see, uh, uh, well, the, 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 the image tells the whole story he's yeah. really concentrated to he's like right before uh, before the fight i guess uh, yeah here uh, yeah beautiful right and this is from from your ethiopia trip of course and you've also been in you know india and vietnam and many other uh, yeah. places of course uh, you know visiting different uh, tribes uh, uh, people yeah nice man beautiful well uh, thank you uh, for uh, showing us some of your uh, works. Can you tell also a little bit about uh, the other, uh, the boy next to you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that one is of course related here to uh, the, the the work aptly named Bird. Yeah, it's a, well, it was a kind of a co coincidence because the Suri people do body painting, what you can see here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a real traditional body painting. Yeah. And this boy catched a bird and he want to show it to me. So. Uh, he yeah, yeah. So he doesn't want to harm it, but he yeah. wants to show it. Look to this beautiful bird. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it was very, uh, very fast action, you know, so yeah, bam, yeah, bam, yeah, yeah. like that. And that's also quite special eh? because you never ever stage anything, like the, the things that people wear and everything. No. You're just there and you go to the, you manage to talk to these people and convince them to show you, you know, some of their uh, rituals and then you're there, but you never. Um, you know, like ask or would pay anybody to like wear something that's completely not. Uh, no, I tried uh, uh -huh. uh, because there are also other pho photographers who uh, photograph the, the Suri people, yeah. but then you see them with really colored faces with leaves and stuff like that, what they usually never do. Yeah, that's kind of fake so, for the tourists. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this is, this is real. This is what, what the Suri people do for hundreds of years, this kind of body painting with the waves, what they do with the fingers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's also all natural material. So what they use is mud and some powder from stones to make these colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I have to shout a little bit because you have the only mic uh, with you right now. Oh, what's going on here? But uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. For showing us a few uh, of your beautiful works. And now you guys have a little bit of an idea of you know, the type of artworks uh, that are here. And so uh, back to the bar. Yeah, you can see we have here also still a lot of other uh, works. Oh yeah, and I need to show you, of course, upstairs. That's kind of nice. Like we have so much uh, here that it's completely impossible for me to tell you guys about everything. Uh, but that then you have a little bit of an idea, you know, the kind of art that I, an artist that I work with. And so upstairs here we have another floor. And it's empty now, more or less empty. Because this is our, uh, well, it's kind of our way to also give some opportunities to new artists and also sometimes people who are like starting kind of new uh, galleries. And we have kind of a pop-up gallery space. So it's like a gallery within a gallery. Now right now there's obviously uh, nobody, nobody here. There's a few pieces still hanging from the previous exposition, which are still going to pick up later this week. But uh, so this is like our temporary exposition space. And so, uh, you know, sometimes when we have new artists or people who want to kind of promote their own works and, uh, you know, want to make a real exposition of it, we uh, bring them in here and we give them a chance to kind of, you know, show their work inside of our gallery, uh, which of course for them is like a really cool uh, chance and it gives us kind of a chance to, you know, bring really cool, fresh artists into the mix. And, uh, also, we have a little space here that we've kind of loaned to some local actors. So, uh, 
here. <laughs> and so they kind of use this as a uh, rehearsal space now, because it's very difficult for them to find space, of course, here within the corona time to work. So we provided them with a, some space here to do some rehearsing. Yeah, so uh, hope that gave you guys a little bit of an idea. Oh. Hope that gave you a little bit of an idea of uh, what I do and uh, where I work when I'm just, uh, you know, doing my regular work days. So I hope you uh, enjoyed that little tour of, uh, you know, where I uh, work on my normal uh, days. And uh, yeah, thank you all again for uh, watching. Make sure to uh, please give the video a thumbs up or to subscribe if you're not uh, subscribed yet. And make sure to hit that subscription uh, bell. And uh, I guess I'll uh, see you all again uh, tomorrow. Oh yeah, and for more info, of course, go to seawolvestv.com. And uh, I'll see you again tomorrow, uh, that time with actually a nice delicious cup of coffee. Ciao!